Hey, Comics Cubers. Today we are here with Rita and Sunny from Astigmata Studios to talk about two of their works. One which showed up in the Girls Love Anthology Gigil from the Philippine International Comics Festival. Uh, their work is called Fairy Bad Mother and a new ongoing series that they have called Akin Ka, or in English, Your Mind. Please come join us. But before you do, please be reminded we do have a Patreon. It's $1 a month. Think of it as a tip jar. If you like what we do here on the Comics Cube and you would like to help keep us going, you know, if you're feeling generous, I uh, could really use a little bit of help just to basically keep the channel running. But please go to Patreon. The link is down below. Uh, and then the rest of the interview is here right now. How are you guys? Uh, we're doing great. We just came from a furry convention where we uh, have been drawing nonstop animal art. <laughs> uh, recovered, mostly. You were recovered. You were one of only two uh, comics people, uh, you know, comics booths, right? At the convention. Uh, actually, I think that like uh, there were a few comics booths there, so it was, uh, it was really few. cool. I think that the comics community is slowly inching in uh, to other niches, you know. Uh, next is the anime. <laughs> the anime conventions. We we can just, like, slip it in. Like, maybe they'll give it a chance. <laughs> it's it's funny because, because at the end of the day, manga and comics are really the same thing from different cultural origins, right? Um, but Filipino comics kind of fall in the middle of those two things. So you... I guess you could easily kind of slide that in there if you wanted to go to, to an anime con. I mean, pretty much. I see a lot of like uh, manga inspired comics that follow like the principles and pacing and framing of manga. I think if you just put that down in like an anime con, they'll just think, okay, that's manga. Let's give it a try. Yeah. <laughs> they only catch on because it's like, left to right instead of right to left that's what it is yeah i have a friend who's a big manga fan and then he got some stuff from from peacock where i met you guys and he started reading it and, and then he realized wait i'm reading this in the wrong order <laughs> no, that's true uh the thing about filipino authors is that a lot of them uh grew up with a mix of american and Japanese media because you know the philippines is in that sweet spot of colonized by both <laughs> <laughs> and um one so, after uh, the other one after the other so our media is basically a mix of both and and so uh some authors their aesthetics when it comes to their artwork it's a combined mix of them because you know a lot of people write from experience and from their lived experiences you see what they grew up with yes um so the first question, I know I've asked questions already. The first question I usually ask anyone who comes onto my show is a very simple one, which is why do you love comics? I okay. didn't say it would be easy to answer. I said it would be simple. Okay. Well, I, I have a, an answer for that right away. I love comics because I like to see, pic I like picture books. <laughs> I like picture books. <laughs> Uh, the thing about comics is that when when people a, a lot of people say that a picture is worth a thousand words, right? So when you look at a comic book, not only are you digesting the prose that it shows you, you also have to look at the pictures that it presents to you as well. Like those two things, like the, what is written and what is drawn, they coincide, and it it makes. It, it gives you a full story and it and it's like reading a movie mm. for me and that's why i love comics so much hmm. let's see well i guess when i was a kid i was a really big into of course like reading novels because that's usually what they want to put in your hands when you're a kid because like it'll make you appear more intellectual to have read like 300 books in a year or something and then here's the thing here was uh basically my cheat day 
is that uh, I've come from a very Catholic family, so I became an altar server uh, or as a Christian or however you like refer to it in your, in your denomination. Uh, and then they'd leave me like at church even after the mass was over for like two hours. But my godfather was the priest, so he'd let me stay over at his house, which was next to uh, the church. And then he didn't know what to do with me, so he just hand me a newspaper. So, of course, I'd skip over all of the boring, like, politics and world event stuff, and I'd just go straight to the comics. And the best part is, when it's Sunday, it's a full spread of comics. One That's page, true, the whole page. It's all just comics. So, like, ever since I was a kid, like, comics were, like, my cheat day, the media that was my escape, because I don't have to do it because anybody expects me to do it. I can just, like, pick it up and then, like, basically have a whole new medium opened up to me that combined like visual expression and also like the the text the dialogue of literature and i mean of course in my child brain it's just like uh pictures and words <laughs> funny great but um eventually when uh my quote unquote taste grew like less childish uh, I like learned to find comics that like fulfill like that narrative desire, like that the narrative fulfillment that I seek for in novels, but also like have a completely different dimension opened up by the visual medium. Cause like, uh, and then of course, um, I eventually returned to uh those so called chi childish comics. And like, kind of end up finding and analyzing like different things that I missed because I was like nine and You're too young. I yeah. didn't really understand what I was looking at. And then, uh, somehow I went from like being in a uh priest's like living room while he's like over there just reading his emails, uh, staring down at Pugat Baboy and meeting Paul Medina Jr. in person and having him sign something for me. So, uh, comics are pretty great. Well, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Uh, when you talked about how comics kind of opened, you know, an, a different angle uh, compared to, like, novels, uh, something similar that, that I realized happened to me was when my dad's sister, she has this entire, like, shelf of uh novels uh romance novels and in in the summer i would actually read them like i i guess it's inappropriate for like a, a 12 year old to go through all these uh fabio romance novels but like you know i loved reading so like and and that was the stuff i had to read i read all my harry potters and i read all my percy jackson so why not the precious hearts <laughs> <laughs> so i would read through them and i'd be like all right that's all right but like I would think that I would be grossed out because obviously I'm 12. But then my my kuya, my cousin, he would have this like uh, drawer filled with Archie comics. And essentially some of the plot lines were the same mm -hmm. as the as the romance novels. But for some reason, it was better to me like when I was a kid. Like It's better when it's Archie. <laughs> because, <laughs> because it's like, funny. I, because it's funny, yes. And not only that, you get to see Archie's facial reactions. Like he's like, oh, he's 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 happy about it. <laughs> he's happy that two girls are fighting over him. That's cool. <laughs> um, Those two girls then, are both too good for him. They're way too of good course. for him. <laughs> Absolutely. But I think that's the appeal of Archie, just having two overly competent and attractive women fight, like f <laughs> essentially fighting over this uh doofus normal guy. <laughs> this this doofus absolutely average guy below average in many ways <laughs> okay yep yeah. i didn't want to say it but that's the thing it only works out in the comics you know but like you know the appeal it works out in the comics like imagine if you're reading a novel it's like there's this guy and he's not really that smart and he's not really that cool it's like okay why are we cheering for this guy i think the level of suspension of disbelief in novels and uh, comics are very different it's true because in I guess if you're reading the Archie comics, 
in your brain you're already registered it's like okay so like this is a completely different world and the rules are very different about how all this social stuff is happening but if you pick up a novel and they try to give you this premise you're like no that's not how it works yeah that it's not true. happened to that guy yeah, yeah. unless it's, it's like about opening a universe unless it's like explicitly a comedy but i yeah, think yeah. that i think that the thing about archie is that because it's drawn and in the best in the best cases of archie comics extremely well drawn sometimes um he looks it looks charming so no matter how stupid he is he has charmed you into liking him because it is well drawn if you if you're doing it in a novel if you're just describing what he is boom there's nothing <laughs> he's just an idiot it's like how when you read the Tintin comics, you kind of get why he gets all the girls because yeah. he's charming and the way he's drawn is like very sweet. But like if you describe Tintin in a book, it's like, why does he get all the girls? <laughs> <laughs> also, I guess Riverdale is not really serious, serious. It's camp. It's, it's camp. It's very campy. Yeah. It's also set in a completely different... You, you, you open Riverdale and you're like, that's not real life. Yeah. I feel like Archie ends up in the Scooby Doo territory. Yes. You know, for me. Where like if the writer wants to take it seriously, it, it kind of like goes into this territory of like, are you really do you really want to take this premise seriously? Because it, it's not gonna work out. Like the gang and their dog is not as compelling if it isn't funny. <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. Like if you take it to the extreme, then to the extreme serious serious tone that it just cycles back to being funny. It's not built to be serious. We we did something like that for our entry in Gigil. The, mm. you know, the the comic kit girls love anthology <laughs> that yeah, we I have, have that over, over there. Here. Uh when we, we we wrote Fairy Bad Mother, it 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 it's like purely we wanted to come up with a comedy. Because we noticed that in the girls' love space, everybody was taking this too seriously. A lot of the works is like so they're so heavy. I was gonna say yes. Like it's true. Uh especially um since a lot of girls' love in the Philippines is aut autobiographical. Like it it's like it's not exactly their experience, but it's something sometimes it's like things that people experience in high school, things they wish that they experienced in terms of like girl relationships but then like where's the comedies like we want something rom-com we want something you can laugh at we want archie <laughs> we want scooby-doo you know so that's what we brought into the girls love space we brought archie scooby-doo <laughs> why can't we have 13 30 turning 30 for the lesbians why why can't we have like bad Adam Sandler movies, except it's sapphic or something. It's uh, true. You go to the past except maybe everybody... they'd be better movies. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps yes. I feel like if we look at past works, a lot of them are like black swan levels of like mind blowing or like um what's a good what's a good drama to 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 compare to like. Like the notebook. Oh. Yeah. Uh, like the level of yeah, seriousness that there's like a seriousness. But then like we, we just uh surprised the anthology with hello, here's fifty first dates. <laughs> like we wanted I, to bring that flavor of comedy into it. I do think that like having read the whole anthology now, I do think that while every story has something to offer, it does seem quite short on the number of comedies in it. Um, I can name two. And yours is the only one that I think is an explicit comedy. Dead Balagtas is one is funny in parts. Oh, yeah. I think hers is satirical too. Yeah, yeah hers it's is satirical. Comedy. It's funny in parts. Um, but yours is delightful is the word I would use. I think it's because uh, our comedy it also plays with their dynamics and romance, right? Yeah. Because like um, the the thing about the dead Balas uh, dead Balagtas's entry is that it 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 hits into 
absurdity and also um uh, it's funny because it references things uh <laughs> things that have happened <laughs> and uh honestly um uh, events like comics events <laughs> yeah. that have transpired and then it, it it puts them into an absurd light that you can laugh at from a distance but for ours it's just playing with the premise and then driving it to the extreme um wait i need to show the way the stuff toys we have <laughs> of our characters <laughs> this is vivian and this is raish these are our two characters in our comic and uh, for the people who haven't read, um, that's GTA amazing. Yet, <laughs> <laughs> they're just here. They're just real. Yeah, we I uh, Rita's uh, mouse pad is actually Vivian. Oh yeah, it is. It's a it's a, it's a pinup Can of Vivian as a demon. Yeah, we do. We have a. We literally love our characters so much that like yeah. we have birth of Vivian as a demon. Oh my god! Yeah. Have to show it. Yeah. Um... <laughs> That's amazing. For me and Rita only. <laughs> Not for anyone else. That's cool. The thing about um so what what some people have said about our characters is that they feel like they have they have a word that or they have a world outside the comic that we're in. And the answer is yes, they have like an entire life story. And when we submitted our comic to uh Gigil, it was basically like a, a snippet of their lives. But like, it does feel short because um, these two have like way more story outside of what we were able to submit in Gigil. The limit was just like, how many pages? I think 24. Like 24 pages. That's all we could fit. <laughs> and I interrupted you earlier when you were going to tell people what it was about. So oh, please oh, go yeah. on. Okay. So uh, Fairy Bad Mother, which is our story is about uh, a teacher who wishes that she could have a husband on a shooting star. And she's given a lovely fairy godmother. Well, lovely is a bit of a stretch. He's a bitch. It's true. <laughs> she's actually <laughs> given a fairy bad mother. Did you and guys rehearse that? From there. No, no. <laughs> we did not. <laughs> Because that was um, pretty awesome. <laughs> the thing about like Vivian, that's the name of the fairy godmother, is that we wanted to take the stereotype of, you know, the fairy godmother, the motherly, um, pristine, perfect woman who guides the protagonists and is wise and, and only provides exactly what they need. Yeah, like wise and mature. And I will say this about like, I guess uh, the stereotype of this type of, like, guardian character. Like, why is he mature and, like, relatively, like, sexless? That's true. Mm -hmm. And uh, we turned her into a 20... 26... 24? Yeah, 24-year-old. Evil, sexy... <laughs> cruel <laughs> um uh very fra very frank and honest person like uh we turned her we basically turned into shigo from kim possible or what, what's a what's a good example let's see like, a, like mirage from the incredibles <laughs> uh i didn't watch kim possible but i know who you're talking about the the, the girl with the black hair we wanted to turn her into like like what what people would think of when they think seductress so it, mm -hmm. and then it would be because it's such a visual it's such a it's such a funny visual and, and such a funny concept that like the fairy that's supposed to guide you to finding a husband is like a like a sexy demon lady <laughs> yeah and also like it, it plays with the I guess visuals that we learned from Disney of like green magic equals evil, evil magic equals mm -hmm. evil. Like the kind of green electricity uh visuals that come off of Vivian are a bit sinister. Yes. Yeah. You like the comic opens with uh beautiful blue moonlight. <laughs> yeah. The exact like pristine Cinderella kind of magic. 
and then uh, you just immediately to switch green it electricity. Uh, but to be fair, Fairy Bad Mother also opens up like, okay, let's be real realistic. Not everybody who's looking for a husband is Cinderella. Yeah. Some of them have energy drinks flying around in their room and uh, various cups and uh, <laughs> a half-eaten cup noodles. <laughs> I'm just trying to make sure the floor is clean. Sorry. <laughs> uh, they think not everybody, like, not every uh, fairy tale is going to have that pristine and perfect. Uh, protagonist but i feel like that is also how a lot of like 2000s and 2010s rom-coms treat it of, like their That's protagonist true. is usually someone who's you know not completely put together for a rom-com in particular if it's like woman focused uh, like in uh princess diaries it was her like that one with the, the where she's like she has to have a makeover because she's not ready to be a princess. Yet. Yeah, I think that's okay, the but let's be let's be real. Her before the makeover is she's what Rache looks like. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's what Rache looks like. Uh, you will you have noticed because you read the comic that after Rache has her makeover, she pretty much looks like the, the same. same person in different clothes. Our joke is that um her makeover where she becomes beautiful. She's it's just her. Yeah, she they just she just combed her hair, gave it a little wash, fixed her clothes. I didn't even like give her new clothes, just like changed it up a little bit. Because um I think the lesson we're trying to impart there is like you don't have to change a lot, you know, about mm -hmm. yourself. Just clean your room. Just clean your damn room. <laughs> <laughs> you know, get get better shampoo. Don't use seven in one or something. Maybe yeah. don't eat cup noodles all the time. Yeah, that's true. Maybe <laughs> eat better. Eat better. And we're like um Something that uh, something that we had fun with doing, and and it's just not it's like a semi spoiler, yeah. But like, is that we put guys in our story? Because like, uh, I will say this, I feel like this is not a fault of these stories because this is not necessarily a negative. But a lot of times when I pick up like a girl's life story. I feel like I'm a transported into a universe where there's no men. And it's like, it's just not realistic because, like, a lot of sapphic people, I feel like, even if we're defined by our attraction to women, we are also defined, like, by our friendship with, with men. Like, I know some people, they don't really have a lot of guy friends, even if they're sapphic, but some sapphics, especially those who are like, masculine like they end up having a lot of friends that are guys and it, it just gets sad not to see like you know like any interaction in that way I know that uh, because of like the shortness of the story you don't get to see like a lot of interactions between different characters but there's like in, an inherent implication in like the male characters or the princess as me and Rita call them uh, the the uh, potential date husbands <laughs> potential husbands. husbands yeah uh the princess it's like strongly implied that all of them are know or like are friends with or at least know vivian that vivian is like actually personally setting them up on the state because i'm gonna say this like there's a lot of like like plot holes in the basic premise of a fair because like if you find somebody a date it's like how, as a magical fairy, how did they get there, and what do they think is happening? Yeah. <laughs> so like, <laughs> the underlying logic of fairy bad mother, and here's the thing. You will realize in the story that for the most part, Vivian doesn't use magic. Magic, yeah. <laughs> she doesn't use magic because all of Rachel's problems are, are solvable. solvable. <laughs> by herself so it's just like um the real magic was in you all along you could have solved your own problems you just needed a prompt which is why vivian just presumably from the logic that the comic is presenting you 
talked to some guys and was like, here's my friend Raish. Would you like to, to go, go on a date, date with, her? with her? She likes food slash she, she likes, likes art, art slash she, she likes, likes games. games. Yeah. <laughs> like it's, yeah. it's a thing that could happen. And it's also, uh, I, I think that the, that part was the most fun, honestly, to write. The three princes and how um, and how they're like everything that Raish is looking for in a husband. And then finding and then realizing that these three guys are basically just Vivian split up into three different guys. And everything that she's looking for is with Vivian. I mean, why do you think it was so easy for Vivian to befriend them? Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> you you are the company you keep, you know. So everything like wraps back to that. Uh, I guess that's also something that uh, we deal with in this generation. Uh, Delulu. Uh, that's something that uh, people in our age group call Delulu. Um, it's because I have heard like, that is the Salulu. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> the thing is, when people say Delulu is a Salulu, it's like they think that their problems can be solved with magic. So they delude it. They delude uh, a better world where all their problems are suddenly like solved but like actually the key is that you just reframe your life mm -hmm. and you realize like what's actually going on and then you'll eventually find the solutions to your own problems you just need to like look at it from a different perspective because like at the end of the day in fairy bad mother no magic was used except for the twist except for the twist which we will not the twist which we will not discuss. Which we will not mention. Because, because the twist is what makes it funny. <laughs> like the twist is like the biggest joke of them all. Because like at the end, you get to see how stupid Raish really is. <laughs> it's like a twenty-page setup for this joke. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. That's the punchline. <laughs> That's amazing. Like uh, when I was reading, when I was reading Gigil, uh, when I got to your story. And I got to the twist. I was like, I kind of saw that coming, but I'm still glad that they went there. <laughs> give it, give it, give it. <laughs> this is no spoiler. We won't explain it, but we'll, we'll put it up. <laughs> yeah. But I love the setup and the and the punchline. That's also how we frame our writing. Even yes. for our horror stuff, it's like, this is the setup for the punchline later. I mean, the punchline is usually a lot, like, gorier. But, you know, it's still a punchline. Um, we have another comic, actually. This is the one that we released in Pico. Like, alongside this, our original one. This is Akinka. Yeah. This is our horror comic. And it is about a little girl in her first week of science high school <laughs> and that that sounds like a, a really sweet and it's so funny because when we were selling this comic uh when people were reading it they were like oh what, what a sweet opening and then suddenly like when they finish it they come back to our booth and go why would you do this to me <laughs> <laughs> because uh that's the thing as sunny said our writing is um it's set up and then pay off if you actually look through all of our comic scripts, we have like this entire page where we start color coding all mm. of our setups and what we're going to do, how it's going to be referenced. And then in the other pages, you get the payoffs, payoff, payoff. So if you look at our scripts, it's going to be like highlighted in orange and red and in green because it's like plot line one, plot line green, plot line orange, plot line red. Or set up green, set up orange, set up red, and then you'll see the payoffs later on. That's an that's incredibly well organized. So I'm gonna ask the two of you: how, What is your process in general? Like, how do you start, and how do you until you get to the end product? Well, let's see. Everything we do is somewhat simultaneous. Yeah, like our writing and our uh thumbing or drawing process is at the same time um back then uh sunny and i like sunny lived in japan and i was still here in the philippines what we would do is we would get this drawing app 
where you could draw at the same time, and then a Google Doc where you could write at the same time. We'd split our screens, and then we would come up with the thumbs of a page, and then we'd put word bubbles, and then I'd start describing what's happening on the page, and then write the dialogue simultaneously. And that's how Fairy Bad Mother was written. It was uh, outline. Uh, outline of what's going to happen first. And then thumbs. And the thumbs are happening while the dialogue is happening. Uh, and then uh, we start uh, assigning, okay, which panel is Rita drawing and which panel is Sunny drawing? And then uh, I I end up drawing like the backgrounds. Uh, yeah, I do the line art for a lot of things. Yeah, and you do the line art. I do. I'm what I do is mostly facial expressions and mm -hmm. character design. So if you see, like, uh, if you notice in Fairy Bad Mother, uh, Raish consistently has this 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 hair poking out of her, and when she's feeling like a love emotion, it turns into a heart. And uh, that's something that continues. And you you can see that, like, when she's sad, it flops down. And then when she's happy, it goes up. <laughs> and that's those are the little things that I, ha I have to um, remember. Uh, I also, like, what I do in the comic is that when the character is making, like, a big facial expression or a big, like, gesture, that's the part I usually draw. And yeah. the, the chibi parts. And then I, because the sketches are done at this point, and then for Fairy Bad Mother in particular, Rita, like, did all of the line over for the characters uh, because we weren't sure how to keep the line work consistent yet. And then I did the backgrounds, uh, you know, and then coloring and rendering. Uh, and then uh, miserably trying to check it through CMYK to make sure it doesn't look bad a in printer. print. Uh, that was our first time doing that. Uh, and now uh, I've, I think I've somewhat gotten it, gotten it for our uh, self-printed comic somewhat. It looks how we intended, thankfully. The thing about like Fairy Bad Mother was us, we were separate for most of it, for most of writing and drawing that comic. And so we had to do everything digitally. And it gave us a lot of grief. Because we had to set file after file after file after file. Then we'd have to have an archive of every page. And then every font. The storage My space adds God, up. How much storage that. space did you use? Uh, well, I have like... How many gigs? I, I, I don't know. All, all I know is that I was pretty... con Because I have a Dropbox account. Uh, so I, there was like two terabytes of free space that I had there, but like it's all I know. I think I was like maybe close to seventy percent, and like eventually when we finished, like from start to finish of the project, we were closer to like seventy-seven percent. It's pretty big for two terabytes. It's really big. Yeah, I know, yeah. but like it's because like I have, I, I on my Dropbox like. Like, there is maybe three to five versions of the same page that we were trying yeah. to edit together. So it kept stacking up. And then we, when, we, when we started, when we met, when you finally moved to the Philippines, we thought, the, hey, what if we just ditched the whole digital thing? And then we did all of our line work on, a pa on paper. Right. And then... We didn't use any fonts, and you just lettered everything, and we got everything done thrice as fast. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> like, and then we got this wonderful scanner, and then what we did was that we took every page that was lined, and we just scanned them. We turned them black and white, then we colored over it digitally. In the day and age when a lot of people are transitioning to digital, you decided that paper traditional was the way to go yes uh <laughs> what what do you remember oh yes uh analog solutions to digital problems that's what uh sir mccoy 
told us uh, the writer for Aswang Hai. Uh, because he was asking us, like, how, how do we collaborate digitally? And then we told him about, like, our process for Fairy Bad Mother. And he said that was very complex. And then when we returned and told him about our process for Akinka, he said, that's brilliant. Yeah. Analog solutions for digital problems. And then uh, we found this out later because he posted it on Twitter. He just went to Kuyasai. to Kuyasai and just started working on paper with him and thumbing with him in person for Aswang Hai 2. Just narrating while he was thumbing. Yeah. So sometimes like you just have to go back to your to the basics and and actually we had way more compliments about the line work for akin ka because people actually saw the the little details that we did yeah is it easier and to draw the, is it easier to draw on paper yes actually like it really is easier to draw on paper and the thing is we can play the thing about uh drawing traditionally and then scanning it later is that you can play with it like a collage. Mm-hmm. And then um because Akinka is set in a school, you, you can actually treat it like a school project and then start putting school materials. This is uh version one print, I think. Yes, uh, let, we can show it. So in our comic, I hope this shows through there. Yeah. You see that uh see that thing that's sticking out? That's an actual note, a sticky note. Oh that we put in front of the page and then scanned over. It's smart. And so it gives the multimedia effect. If you wanna achieve the same thing in Photoshop, like you'd have to go through like have to like take the image, crop the image, paste the image. But then on put the Put in the drop just, shadow. Yeah, exactly. But in the scanner, it's just Slap down there. <laughs> and then uh we did this. We re- when you realized we could do this, we did this for even more pages. And so um our main character, she's a child. She is like 12 years old in this comic. And if you look into her thoughts, uh her, the the visual gag is that her brain is a notebook. And it it, it her brain, her thoughts are in notebook okay. paper. Yeah. And not only that, she thinks in shoujo anime style. So you can you can look into a child's brain. I think the same gag was used in like Squirrel Girl or something, right? I think. Or was it Gwenpool? What? Neither Gwenpool. of those two would surprise me. Yeah, yeah, that's why we're confused. Exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, the gag is that like when you look into their mind, it's like. A child, a child scribbles on a piece of notebook, and it's like that's a fun VFX thing, that 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 is done in animation. So why not also just paste the notebook on the piece of paper and scan it? Yeah. Uh. Our wait. Did we explain our pro- traditional process? Oh yeah. Okay. Uh. I I'm just gonna outline it step by step. Uh. It starts with uh on a piece of sketchbook paper. Uh, I write down how many numbers of pages this is going to be. And on each page, I write down what's going to happen after me and Rita discuss. That's our outline. Uh, and then uh, we get to summing it in real life, uh, in real time, together. Uh, and then... Oh, fun fact about our thumbing process. When there's a dialogue, sometimes we just start acting it out. Yeah, we start acting out the dialogue. The this one you can see our dialogue based writing when you read the arguments in our right in our in our books. Uh, I think as a I don't know what to think Fairy about Bad, that. <laughs> as someone who's read Fairy Bad Mother, uh, if you look at the arguments there, those were in real time happening, and then we were writing them down. <laughs> like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> do, you, do you each take a part? Yeah, we yeah, choose, yeah. We choose who we get. We choose to be who we get to point. be, and then so like, then we start going. It depends on like who grabs what dialogue first. Uh, I think it helps it sound a bit more natural. It's mm-hmm. true, and it flows from like the pay- It flows from the dialogue box better. If if it feel if there if you can understand what's the cadence. Yeah, and uh, it 
it does help because in Akanda, there is somebody who like talks in a very stilted way. Um, oh, yeah. She's nervous. So uh, when we're acting it out, we can say what she's going to say and then decide uh, to denote the fact that it's stilted where we're going to put like the, the period, the periods, like yeah. the hard stops in her uh, speech. Also, it's just fun because we basically just start voice acting yeah, we are we're also like voice actors. You could tell. Uh, we're we're voice actors, so even though nobody's gonna hear it, we all know what everybody sounds like. Uh, here's an example of like what our dialogue boxes look like. At the uh, we we end up making them look like this is bub- bubble one, two, three because like since we voice them out. They're ba- we basically bubble it in the way we've said it. Pretty much. Also, like, I don't know, it's just good spacing. That's I true. think. Yeah, I think weird. people should uh, also, like, I, I just feel this whenever, like, I read a comic with, like, a giant speech bubble. I'm like, break that up, man. Break it up. You can break no, that I, up. I think that, too. Like, a lot of the time. Yeah. And I think, like, a lot of comics, um, not only that, but sometimes it's not clear who's talking. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. It's like there is a random dialogue bubble in the middle of the <laughs> channel. You tell me what's going on. It's like it's pointing Especially... to somebody's butt, but like I'm like, okay, we just Oh man. Especially if it's like a, either my difficulty is if it's a fight scene or if there's like six people in a room or something. Mm-hmm. Like you've already lost me. I remember there was this comic that we read that tried to like avoid this by color coding who's talking in the the speech bubbles, but they forgot they what switched, color was who. So they, they switched, switched up the colors, and we know because like <laughs> the, uh, they say the name of the other person. Yeah, like <laughs> when they start talking to each other, it's like okay, either that person just said their own name, <laughs> or they mix or up. up the the di- like the dialogue colors. Uh, but I mean, it's good that people are, are trying to find solutions to that, though. But oh, we came up with a weird solution for Akinka so that we could so that we could tell the readers what are the internal thoughts versus the you know what she's saying. Because um, okay, so in our comic, there are dialogue boxes, of course, as every comic has. But then, um, you know, when you when the, the main character is having a monologue or she's uh, thinking thoughts and they're being uh, shown in the comic, they are uh, represented by these boxes that have flowers on them. Oh. Yeah. Because me and like Rita play a lot with like the shape of what a dialogue bubble looks like. So if we make it square... Uh, or not quite perfectly square, it's not immediately obvious that it's not a dialogue box. So we've uh, basically... This is Gravia praying at night. We've uh, added flowers with specific meanings that tie into what she's thinking or feeling at the time. Uh, I guess that's specifically for people who are into that kind of thing. That's true. Flower, uh, for some... People who are very into flowers, they know that some flowers hold meanings, like how roses are, like hold many different uh, gift connotations, like a a yellow rose is friendship, a red rose is romance. And uh, I guess that's one part of like our process in which uh, I am like keeping a list to keep track of which flowers I've used for which meanings. For the prayer scene of our comic, the flowers that decorate Grazia's internal monologue box, it's Sampagita garlands. Yeah. Uh, Which are sold in churches and which are associated with prayers. The inspiration for that in particular is the fact that Grazia is very into plants. She's a a plantita in the making. That's what I say. (laughs) I am surprised to hear that you two didn't actually meet until after like, we didn't meet in person. I mean, we've met in person before, but... We were, like, in high school. We were in high... Like, 
we met in person, I think, very sporadically. We're internet friends, as you may have realized from our stories. Uh, but we met each other in high school, like on Tumblr. Uh, and then uh, we met in real life, maybe like... In the Oopcat. At Oopcat. Yeah, at the Oopcat. Because I had to go home to take the Oopcat. And then... Okay. Uh, I didn't really do anything about it. I still went to Japan for college. Uh, you know. And it's then fine. eventually, uh, Sunny came back from Japan. And then uh, now they uh, live in the Philippines. And uh, what's funny is that our, our comic, Akinka, is actually about the science high school experience. And that was like one of the big things that we had in common when we were like kids. That mm-hmm. like you came from... Uh, Philippine Science High School. And I came from Mutinlupa Science High School. And then we would relate uh, to each other when it comes to like toxic uh, scholarship Filipino culture. And when I say toxic Filipino scholarship culture, it's like the pressure to stay in a school, in a school that's free. Yeah. Uh, because like in these schools, you have to have an 80% grade average. And then below that, you'll get kicked out. Because, like, you have to keep your grades up. There's also, like, the pressure to pass the upcat from these schools. Like, they're literally gonna put up your passing rates. Like, every after, yeah. They go, oh, this school had a 93% passing rate for the upcat. Like that. And, like, if you didn't pass the upcat, it's, like, your shame. It's, like, oh, you contributed to the lowering yeah. of the passing rate. I mean, I was in Japan and I took it anyway. That's a and lot like, of pressure. Exactly. And the thing is, now, imagine that academic pressure alongside school drama. Like, actual, like, bullying and relationship drama. And in Akinka, our, our story, uh, a toxic, abusive girlfriend that's really, really rich. <laughs> you know? And um, in, in our story, we play with themes of, like, class. Because uh, the thing is, when it comes to science high schools, a lot of rich people end up sending their kids there mm-hmm. because it's prestigious. And it's, like, it feels like a, a guaranteed slot to a top university, right? But a lot of poor people also send their kids to science high schools and, and middle class people. A lot of them send them there because it's for free. And it takes a lot of the financial stress away from sending their kids to like a private school that they have to pay for. And it's like, you know, um, for some people, it's it's better to send them to science high schools it's because it's something to brag about too. Yeah, so you have this very strange class dynamic going on. And you can see it in our comic. Uh, and that's something that we've also studied when we talk to other people. Uh, you can tell if a character is wealthy or if a character is middle class or if they're poor based on like what they wear, what they speak, and how they like move themselves. It's very interesting because uh, I never realized this would happen, like putting out our first like self-published comic. Just like staring at somebody's reactions and seeing what they're getting. And it's like, oh... Yeah, they understand that this character is like that and like this. Because, like, people are exactly picking up the vibe. It's so surprising because, like, we have this, like, mentor. And she's, uh, she's like, way older than us. She's, like, she's old enough to be a mother of one of these high school kids. And then she got to uh, the antagonist. And she was like, oh. I know a girl just like this. <laughs> yeah. And it's so cool because our antagonist transcends time. That like somebody who is born an entire generation away from us could say, oh, I knew a girl like this in college. That's like, you did? That's Whoa. cool. <laughs> and um, oh yeah, we haven't even said the other layer of our comic, which is that everybody in our comic is uh, represented by an animal and most of them are animals endemic to the philippines yes and you can tell if a character is not filipino based on what animal they are 
So for example, there's a panda in a in a in a class, and you can tell that she's the Chinese girl that that's there. Here's our main character, Grazia. She's a carabao. Carabao. That's why when she's older, so her her hair is longer. <laughs> and um, the thing about the animals and what like people ask us why we had to like put animal elements and animal ears on our characters. First of all, it makes the silhouettes very easy to yes. remember. Like yes. everyone's in a school uniform. That's true, right? Like that's why anime. Like, if you notice all the anime characters, they have, like, red hair, blue hair, pink hair. A lot of them do that because they all wear the same uniform. Just so recognizability. That's it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But, like, in Akinka, the silhouettes are easier to recognize. Like, obviously, the one with the big horns and the ears. That's a car about. That's our main character, Grazia. But they're also animals because if since, like, we already told you about how there's lots of pressure... And it's it's really hard to go to a science high school. It's also very competitive. It's like a jungle. And it's survival of the fittest. So all of them are basically animals fighting for their place to live in this jungle <laughs> that they were placed into. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's important to note that it's also like uh, purely symbolic. Yeah. I, I We open it with the fact that it's purely symbolic. Mostly because we know that people would yeah, you they know. would like ask about the biology. Like, it's like, okay, this is this animal. Are we doing B stars? Yeah. Like, is this? Are we doing like, um, are we doing like half animal people? Like, you know, we knew that that people would ask that. So we just put a disclaimer that like it's it's purely symbolic. They're all human. Okay. It also helps because we can show them a dead body that looks like a dead animal instead of a dead body. That's true. It's what keeps our comic thirteen plus. <laughs> Like we don't show an actual human's uh corpse on the ground. We show like a cat or, or something. It's true and that like, it works that um, way. Yes. Exactly. Uh when we were selling this comic in Peak Off, there was a mother and her child that went to our booth. And then um the kid was interested in the cover and we had to tell her it's it's a horror. And then we asked, How old are you? And she was like, I'm 13. Then her mom picked up the comic, she read it, she saw the major spoiler at the end and then she closed it and said we're buying this comic <laughs> yeah. I mean I will say she's kind of mean because it didn't end there she put it down she dragged her wall and she, and she said I don't have cash and then she made the kid pay for it yeah <laughs> that is the awesome thing, um, something fun about our comic is that there is like we use this animal um uh, this animal symbolism, uh, and like we turn our we periodically in the comics we turn our protagonists and all their friends into animals, and like we we put them in cute scenarios where like here here she is with her Tarshir friend on her back, they're having lunch, and like um our readers would say it's really cute when you transition them into real animals. I really like that part. And then she reads the comic later on and it's like, oh, I thought it was all going to be cute scenes. Yeah, I I feel like uh, that is like one... Uh, I will not... I don't know if it's an issue, but maybe like a bit of an interesting uh, phenomenon that happens because there are people that pick up this comic and they don't hear a spiel and they don't hear the explanation. They just pick it up. And one of Rita's friends is like, I know what this is about. Picks it up, comes back. I did not know what that was about. <laughs> um, uh, but great. Uh, thanks. Um, I mean, it was good. It's just not what I thought it was going to be. Um, I feel like, uh, I, I mean, we tried with like the cute little girl surrounded by like various... Uh, wild animals to betray the vibe but i think some people zero in on the cute girl yeah i think some people think it's gonna be like totoro yeah like you know there's like a little girl and she goes on an animal adventure some people don't understand the color coding yeah that's true like yeah. the, the, the the dark red kind of that's... it's a little it's a little bit more obvious when it's put beside diliman and patay kumpatay yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, but I mean, it... coming from, from coming from your story in Gigil, I don't think you know, I don't think people would be expecting. Yeah, they see a cute curly haired girl in the cover. It's like, yay, it's gonna be just like Fairy Bad Mother. It was not, in fact, like Fairy Bad Mother. Yeah, that was a mild uh problem in Peacock. And they're like, no, no, no. It's not a comedy. Oh, that's true. Like our, our we had um that's true. Uh there were people who purchased Gigil and they'd become fans already because they liked their entry in Gigil. They went to our booth and they'd be like, This is your next one. I'm so excited to read it. And it's like it's a horror. It's a oh. horror. It's a horror. <laughs> and it's about toxic uh, lesbian relationships. It's, it, it's, a, it's <laughs> very different from the last thing we did. <laughs> um, oh, man. Uh, actually, I wanted to talk about something in our comic. And it's uh, how different people can interpret different things from it. Okay. And it's because, like, uh, we wrote this comic from our lived experiences, right? Like... The two of us went to science high schools and uh, the two of us have lived very different lives, but we compiled like what we knew of the world and then we wrote characters based on like our friends, our loved ones, our enemies, our exes. And then uh, we, we, we put them in the mush and then uh, we made them into people. And sometimes like when people pick up this comic and start reading it, they suddenly start seeing themselves in this in these people. Oh. And it's so interesting to watch it unfold. Because like I, I had this uh friend who who read the comic and then he started like speaking in this one character's voice like passionately, like when they were reading the words in the script. And then like in the in the scene where like this character was fighting another character. He was just shouting them already because it was an argument that he had had before with another friend. Yeah, and I was shocked that he just straight up said a real person's His name. name. Yeah, like, not the character's name. Like not the character. Like he like got flashbacks, <laughs> yeah. to, like a high school argument that he had, and then he's like, because in the comic, it's two people arguing about a movie. A movie. Yes. Like uh, like uh. A cult classic. A cult classic. Yeah. No, it's not even a cult classic. It's a classic classic. A classic classic. Sorry. Yeah. I forgot how old it was. And he also, like previously when he was in high school, was talking to somebody who was very uppity about movies. And then he started going completely off script. Yeah. And he wasn't reading anymore. And he was, and he started saying, like, you're not more educated than me just because you went to a Germany trip to watch film. And then we were like, oh, wait, 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 we didn't put that in our comic. <laughs> That's not, I remember the dialogue. That's not in there. Are you okay? Yeah, a, a lot of people who relate to our characters, we ask them, like, are, are you, you okay? okay? <laughs> um, I... Uh, we find that whenever somebody relates to like a character in uh, Akenga, I think because it's like, I, I guess because it's distilled like strange and upsetting experiences from our uh, childhood. teenhood, yeah. childhood, that whenever they relate to a character, it's always in a way that's a bit off-putting. Uh, but I guess that's what you get from relating to a character in a horror comic. It it's very interesting, like somebody like looked at a character, did not relate to the character, but he's like, but he straight up in his mind said, "It's like, I feel like she's my daughter." Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and I need to give her fatherly advice. I feel like I've been absent in her life, and I need to help her. Which is funny because this is a character with an absent father. Yeah. So like, and then he and he straight up made up a scenario on why he's an absent father. Why he's an absent father, and it's like, well, that's the exact scenario, and it's strange that you got that off of the character. But I understand because we laid down a lot of implications. But it's still strange for somebody to pick up the comic and be like, I feel like I am the specific character's father. <laughs> It's it's actually really funny because as as we told you, the way we write is that we write a lot of setups. And mm -hmm. then later on we pay we pay off the reader. But like 
the thing about our comic akin guys we have so many loose threads that like if you are perceptive enough or like you understand the 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 things that are going on in this comic you can pick on the loose threads some people already pre- like figured out spoilers for the eighth chapter of our comic in chapter one and that it's crazy. Yeah, some people pick up our, like at peak of picked up our comic, left, came back like a little bit later, like slammed it down on the table and was like, "Is this gonna happen?" <laughs> like they straight up like I I can't even say it. They straight up just like a spoiler. spoiler. They shout the spoiler at us and we can't even say anything. And it's like, and then the reply would know. be like, "Why are you quiet? Why are you quiet?" <laughs> I, I I don't know. It's it's actually really scary because like the uh I think that like Akinka is so um like our Filipinoness and uh, our experiences living is so ingrained in Akinka that like our group of random ladies in Peacock approached me and asked is the main character of this comic Batang Genya in origin and I was <laughs> like what because my parents are both from Batangas. And I was like, how could you say that? Like, I was thinking, okay, um, why? And I asked them why. And then uh, they were just saying, oh, it's because in in the province, we think, in the South province, we think that Muntinlupa, Paranaque, and Las Piñas are just one city. And, and in... the city, in, in, in our comic, it's set in the fictional city of Muntiparlas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Muntiparlas. They said, and then they also added that like the main character is a kalabaw because in in Batangas there are a lot of karabaws, and that like uh there's like a I think there was a like a city in Batangas that is known for like uh the beef that they sell, and for like for bulalo, and then a lot of it is kalab uh karabaw meat also, and it's like, wait, you guys are writing new layers that we didn't put down for the comics. Like you guys are adding more stuff. But like you said, your family is from Batangas. Like that's the thing that happens in writing. A lot of like your lived experience you weren't thinking about ends up getting put on the page. And it's there anyway. No, it is there anyway. When we were talking about our comic to the Museum of Mundin Lupa, because they because they asked us like what we did, and we told them that we were comicero, so they asked about our comic. When they figured out that our main character was a Carabao and she lived in the fictional city of Monteparlas, what they said was Montin Lupa used to be like a huge cattle farm. And that like the reason why there is a anti venom for the Philippine cobra is because of because they kept biting the cows and the calabaos that lived in Montin Lupa. And so that so uh, the doctors in Mundin Lupa developed an anti venom for it, and we were like, "What? What? <laughs> we didn't know this stuff. We just, we just made her a carabao because that's the national animal." <laughs> but like, it turns out there was like, I mean, also because she's like a hardworking, oh, hard-headed, she's also hardworking, yeah, hard-headed little girl. But you and know. also like additional themes yeah. of like. Yeah, <laughs> obviously, but it, it's very interesting to see what people take out of the comic, and it's very interesting to see how many punchlines are, I guess, like payoffs people predict. Like you saying that you predicted what was gonna happen, happen in Fairy Bad Fairy Mother. Bad Mother. Like you already knew what direction it was going. Uh, like that's good. That's good. I'm gonna say this now. Uh, for all the writers out there. When people know where your writing is going and they predict the spoiler, you don't have to start making random twists up. That's true. It's That's because correct. good that they can predict it. That when is they predict absolutely it, it means correct. That they paid attention. Like, do not punish your readers for analyzing your work. It's good because that means they liked it so much they used their brains. It's great. It's absolutely correct because sometimes there is only one satisfying ending. Yeah. And yeah. and just because it's the predictable one doesn't mean that you have to. It's bad. Doesn't mean it's then bad. You have to twist it around. 
It needs to make sense at the end of the day. There's this video game. I'm sorry, it's a very short rant. There's this video game called Five Nights at Freddy's. And, and then um the thing oh, yeah, is, my niece loves uh, that game. Okay, good. There's this guy who makes theories about that game. And sometimes he gets it right. And what's annoying is that the guy who makes the game suddenly starts changing the story of the game because the guy who makes the theories got it right. And so, like, no! He made the theory because he liked your game. Why did you change it? Now it doesn't make any more sense. So the thing about Five Nights at Freddy's is that it, at the end of the day, the story stopped like stopped with all continuity and and with all uh all of the twists that don't make any more sense because it at the end it became random because he was and just that's reacting trying to avoid exactly yeah, yeah. uh i think yeah. this is a very much a, a spoiler culture i yes. guess i yeah. call it issue i don't know don't react uh, to what people are don't react to what people are saying tell the story that you want to tell exactly yeah, it's your story like uh you know the movie knives out right yeah like you know knives out okay uh the two of us predicted the murderer immediately there is like only the one person movie. where it makes exactly. sense yeah exactly and even in glass onion we knew yeah it's like, yeah but it was still a good it's movie. still a good movie yeah. like like you shouldn't like base your writing ability on how unpredictable you are it's all about how you're telling the story because like if people can predict the ending but they want to read it anyway that's great yeah that means that you've created the world that your readers want to stay in yeah you know sometimes yeah. you get people saying you know reading a book or watching a movie or something and then they they say something like i swear if they don't stick the landing then this movie then i'm going to say this movie is bad right so there's really only one way sometimes <laughs> For it to for it to and, be satisfying, and that's like something that we 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 try to do in Akinka, and like everything that we write leads up to the ending, or frankly the the payoffs that we're planning for later on in the comic. And when people like approach us, and then they tell us our own endings or our own uh, payoffs, it's like, okay, we won't confirm it, we won't deny it. But we're very proud of you. Like in their minds, are like, dang. But sometimes people will start doing conjecture and then end up in the point that yeah. like there are things that we don't even like set up in chapter one that people just start predicting, yeah. which is weird, right? <laughs> yeah, I think it's because of like the mood of the comic itself that like. That where people like uh just make up stuff. <laughs> yeah. And it's like it's funny because like I think I also think it's because the books that we have read before and like um comics that we've read before are also reflected in uh in uh, in our work. As as I said earlier, a lot of Filipinos uh because of colonization, we we grew up on American and Japanese media. I think that like there are some tropes that you can predict will happen in the comic because of the because of what we grew up we've grown up with <laughs> yeah pretty much tell I me want them to do that though tell me um now that it's obvious that the reception to Akinka has been pretty good uh pretty tell good. me Sorry. and uh tell the viewers uh how you can buy this book and okay. Gigil. So, Gigil is available at the Comicet website. It's also available at every Comicet art market that will come out. Yeah, no, that's fair. Uh, we also are. Uh, we we will also be at Comicet October on October twelfth and thirteenth, and in those events, Manila International Book Fair, Comicet October, and all the preceding comic kits that's where you can buy gigil yeah as there, well as the website there will be a comic it booth which with a bunch of books published by comic it will be there just ask any staff member they can point you to it just look for the two girls kissing <laughs> okay as for akinka well there also be at the comic at events because we will be there in our booth selling your 
the the physical comic. But they're also uh, the comic is also available digitally um, at itch itch.io. Yes, itch.io. Um uh, itch.io uh the Astigmata Studios one. I mean it's Astigmata Studios dot itch.io. And uh, how and... do people Okay, go on. Oh, and well, technically the order forms aren't up yet. We took some pre-order forms and we did ship them before the Philippine International Comics Festival. But eventually, uh, probably after Chapter 2 is out, uh, we'll be opening pre-order we'll forms pre -order on our forms Facebook again. page. How do people find you on social media? Okay, so... Astigmata. <laughs> uh, so on Facebook, it's Astigmata Studios. And then on Twitter, it's Astigmata Studio. And on Instagram, it's also Astigmata Studios. Uh, like, Twitter is the only one where there isn't an S on the end just because we There's ran a character into limit. the character limit. You two are awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the Comics Cube. Congratulations. I hope sales continue to, to be good. Hey, thank you so much for having us here. It's, a, it's an honor. Yeah. I thank mean, you. you're Durtano. We have. Thank you. <laughs>